Hi everybody, this is Dr. Wright. Welcome to our supplemental lecture. I intend for this to be about a 20-minute presentation. I just want to make sure that we have everything that we need for the exam that's coming up. And so this 20-minute supplemental lecture is intended to prepare us for lecture tomorrow. So please, everybody, make sure you watch this all the way through before class tomorrow. So what we want to do is we want to talk about banks in chapter 12. And we saw a glimpse of why banks are so important. And when I say banks, I'm talking about commercial banks. So in yesterday's lecture, we talked about the financial crisis. And you could see we talked about real estate being the epicenter of that crisis. Well, in the heart of the epicenter of the crisis, we saw commercial banks. Turns out that commercial banks are immensely important to our financial system. And you can see on the screen here, I have uh, this is an animation of a heart beating. I like to think of banks literally as the heart of our financial system. And if you consider what the heart does in the human body as it pumps, what it does is it sucks in blood that has been deoxygenated. It directs that deoxygenated blood to the lungs where, it's th where it then becomes oxygenated. And then it reroutes the blood to the muscles and the brains. It reroutes the blood to the muscles and the brains to deliver new oxygen. Of course, we know that the brain and the muscles and the organs in the body uh, all require oxygen in order to function. So the heart plays this vital role in the human body of sucking in blood, oxygenating it, and then distributing it to the parts of the body that need it the most. Well, I happen to believe that banks do the same thing in our financial system. So you can see here a picture of Zions Bank and US Bank. So think about what banks do in our economy. Banks draw in money in the form of deposits, and then they decide how they're going to lend those deposits out. So they literally suck in the money in the form of deposits, and then they redirect the money in the form of loans, car loans, home loans, uh, home equity lines of credit, consumer loans, business loans. And uh, I want to try to help you understand the magnitude of how much money flows through banks. So if you go to the Federal Reserve website and you look at the aggregate bank balance sheet for all commercial banks in the United States of America, right now there is $14 trillion in assets in US commercial banks, which is just enormous, especially if you contrast that against US GDP, which we know is $16 trillion. So our entire economy is $16 trillion. There are $14 trillion worth of assets just in our commercial banks. And so hopefully, Hopefully that helps give you a sense for the size and the magnitude of these banks. And again, I view the banks as the heart of our financial system, drawing in that blood, which would be the money, $14 trillion worth of money, and then redirecting it out in the form of loans and sending it to the parts of our economy that need it the most. So what I would like to do, let me get back to the Zions Bank picture here. What I would like to do is have us just very quickly sort of organically create a bank. It's going to be a very simple bank. And in order to motivate, motivate that, we need to understand that uh, since time immemorial, there have always been sort of two sorts of people in our economies and financial systems. There have been what I like to call the haves and the have-nots. Uh, in other words, there have been people who seem to have excess wealth. They have more money than they want to consume. And there have been people and there have been people who don't have enough money and they can't uh, or they want to consume more than they actually have the wealth to consume. So generally speaking, these people would like to preserve and grow their wealth. On the other side of the equation, the people who don't have enough wealth have a very simple objective they would like to get their hands on more wealth. Now, there could be a host of reasons why these people want to get their hands on wealth. Maybe they simply want to consume. Maybe they want to buy something that they can't afford to buy, and so they want to borrow money to do it. But it could be that they have a really great, innovative idea. They have a company they want to start. They have a product they want to launch, something that could be really beneficial in the march of the standard of living for humans, and they need capital to get it off the ground because, after all, Almost any great idea requires some capital to get it going. Well, since these people want to preserve and grow their wealth, and these people want to get their hands on wealth, there's the potential for a mutually beneficial transaction here. Perhaps the haves could lend money to the have-nots, and the have-nots would pay interest and eventually pay back the principal. 
Well, let's imagine this on a small scale in our own lives. Let's imagine that you're graduated from college and you're single, and so you have a roommate, and your roommate's name is Pete. And you make a little bit more money than Pete, and so you've been able to save up and you have some extra cash. Pete also has a good job, but he hasn't really been, a really been able to save up quite as much as you have, although he is saving on a monthly basis. And Pete, Pete has a dream. Pete wants to buy a car. And so Pete's been eyeing this vehicle for some time. And, and yes, you think it's ridiculous. It looks like a cow, and what's with the skull and the crossbones? That doesn't even match with the cow theme. But Pete is pretty set on this vehicle, and you try to convince him. It's like, Pete, look, you're going to be laughed at. You can't take that thing on the freeway. Uh, but Pete wants it. And the price tag is $10,000, and he's been saving up for it. And he thinks that in about four or five years, he's going to have enough money to buy it. Of course, the problem is that car isn't going to be there four or five years from now and you realize in this situation Pete bless his heart is a have-not he doesn't have enough money to buy the car that he wants you on the other hand you are a have because you have a good job because you've been saving you have extra money and you think to yourself well you know I have ten thousand dollars I I could perhaps lend this money to Pete and so you approach him. You say, look, Pete, we could do a really simple transaction here. I'll lend you the $10,000. Why don't we make this a simple, straightforward loan? We'll just make it an interest-only loan for four years, and then you pay me back the $10,000. The interest payments would be pretty low if we're talking about $10,000, 6% interest for four years. Interest payments would be pretty low, and you can keep saving up money. And then when you get the $10,000, you pay it to me, and you get the car right now. And, and Pete is really thrilled with this. He says, let's do it, and so you guys go ahead and enter into the transaction. You loan $10,000 to your friend Pete. Pete is ecstatic because he gets to buy his car, which is ridiculous, but you've made your friend very, very, very happy. So how does this look for you in terms of cash flows? Well, I'm using some technical terms here, but essentially you've just started your own bank. And what you've done is you've brought $10,000 worth of capital to the table. In the world of banking, we don't usually refer to it as equity. We call it bank capital. So you guys are all accountants. You understand balance sheets very, very well. Whenever you see bank capital, you should just think bank equity. It's the same thing. So you've brought $10,000 of bank capital to the table, which means your personal bank has $10,000 of total assets and $10,000 of loanable assets. You're going to charge Pete 6% interest. It's going to be an interest-only loan, so the math is really simple. Every year, you're going to earn $600 in interest income. Now, you're not having to pay interest expense to anybody, so that also represents your net interest income. And down here, I just calculate some ratios for us. So your ROA is 6% and your ROE is also 6%. Now, you've made Pete really happy. He has his crazy car. You're feeling pretty happy. You're earning $600 a year. But you think to yourself, man, this is easy money. I, I wish I could scale this up. I wish I could lend out $100,000 at 6%. But you don't have $100,000. You only have $10,000. But you start to think to yourself, well, what if I could operate like a bank? What if I could somehow attract deposits or maybe even borrow money at a low rate, then I could turn around and lend it out at 6%. And you might even say to yourself, I'm just going to specialize in car loans. That's all I'm going to do is I'm just going to do $10,000, 6% car loans, interest only, boilerplate template. I'm just going to do everything the same. But in order to attract deposits, you, you know, certainly you would try to attract deposits by offering services, and banks do this, right? So what are services that they offer? Protection, right? They're going to keep your money safe. Accounting services, they'll send you monthly statements. They'll help you with payment functions, so they'll give you electronic bill pay. So banks certainly try to attract deposits through the services that they offer, but at the end of the day, you almost always inevitably have to offer some interest. So maybe you offer one 0.5% interest on any deposits. Now, another little vernacular note here. I have interest rate on borrowings. You might wrinkle your nose and say, why is he calling deposits borrowings? Well, from the eyes of the bank, that's exactly what deposits are. You're borrowing money from your customers for the purpose of lending them out. But remember, at any point in time that your customers want to withdraw their deposits, generally speaking, 
you have to let them. So in a very real sense, deposits are borrowing. Okay, so you're offering 1.5% interest on any deposits at your bank. And before you know it, you're able to attract some deposits. And let's say that you're able to attract deposits of $90,000. So you brought $10,000 of capital, you have $90,000 of borrowings, total assets of $100,000, and we're going to assume there are no reserve requirements at this point. So you're not going to hold on to any of that money, you're going to loan it all out. So you loan out the entire $100,000. You're earning 6% interest on the $100,000, so your net interest income, or sorry, your gross interest income is $6,000, but now you are having to pay interest. How much? 1.5% on the $90,000 of deposits. So the interest expense for you is $1,350, and so your net interest income is $4,650. I've recalculated the ratio, and this is where something really spectacular happens. If you remember, before you borrowed anything, your ROA was 6%, your ROE was 6%. As you lever up, look at what's happening. Your ROA is going down, but your ROE is shooting through the roof. And so with this capital structure, 10,000 of capital, 90,000 borrowed, you've got an ROA of 4.65%, an ROE that's an astonishing 46.5%. And you're thinking to yourself, this is just simply amazing. Well, this, my friends, is the power of leverage using other people's money to make your profit causes your return on equity to go through the roof. You think to yourself, well, this is just fantastic. Of course, you'd want to scale it up even more. So for an actual bank, the numbers might have some zeros added to them. So for an actual bank, maybe they have $100 million of bank capital, and maybe they have $900 million of borrowings, so their total assets are a, a billion dollars. And what if they lend out all billion dollars, right? If they lend out all billion dollars, then they're going to have interest income of 60,000, which is just the 6% times the billion dollars. Again, they're going to have interest expense. It's going to be 1.5% charged against the $900 million in borrowing. So they're going to have an interest expense of 13.5 million, which gives them net interest income of 46.5 million dollars. Again, the ratios are going to stay the same. Your ROA is 4.65, your ROE is 46.5, which is incredible, and your net interest income is 46.5 million dollars. And so this is the essence of how banks operate. Highly levered. They borrow money from depositors and pay them an interest, and then they turn around and loan it out at a much higher rate, and they make that spread, and this can be highly profitable. But hopefully you've recognized, if you try to run a bank the way that I'm suggesting, it is going to go bankrupt, and it's going to become insolvent very, very quickly. Now, before we talk about why that is, let's make one other observation here. Sometimes when I show this to students, they're a bit incredulous. They say, Dr. Wright, what bank in its right mind would have $100 million of bank capital against $900 million of borrowings? That degree of leverage seems um, unreasonable and unrealistic. Well, if you go back to the aggregate bank balance sheet that I showed you earlier, we discovered that banks have net assets, or sorry, banks have assets of $14 trillion. Well, we can scroll down and see that their total liabilities are $12.6 trillion. So think about that. Total assets right now at banks is $14.1 trillion. Total liabilities is $12.6 trillion. So my debt to capital ratio is actually very realistic and almost exactly what you would see on a typical bank's balance sheet right now. But because of how highly levered this bank is, and because of the way that I've structured it, it's doomed to fail. And so let's think for just a few minutes about why this bank is doomed to fail. And the first most obvious reason that would lead to bank failure is if our depositors want their money back en masse. So for instance, what if something like this happened? 
This is a picture of the bank run that happened at Indy Mac Bank back in 2008. The bank was going insolvent. There were a lot of negative news stories about it. Everybody knew there were problems. Before we knew it, people were lining up to take their money out. If people lined up to pull their money out of our bank, we would have all sorts of problems because we don't have their money. Remember, we lent out the entire billion dollars. Now, so we call that liquidity risk, this idea that our depositors are going to demand their funds. We don't have their funds. Again, we call that liquidity risk. But there's also another form of liquidity risk that's related to this first type of liquidity risk. We could try to sell some of our loans, right? We have a billion dollars worth of car loans. We could try to sell those car loans to other banks or to investment banks who might want to securitize them and turn them into asset-backed securities. So we might try to sell these car loans to liquidate them, to give our money to our depositors so that we don't get put under by liquidity risk. But the problem is we might run into a fo another form of liquidity risk. It might be challenging for us to sell those car loans uh, in an expeditious manner. So you might struggle to, to sell those car loans quickly and at the right price. And so in that case, the only way you can meet your depositor request would be to do fire sale prices. So you're selling off your assets at ridiculously low prices just because you need the cash to pay your depositors. So those are the two forms of liquidity risk. The first form, again, is where your depositors are trying to pull out their money and you don't have it. The second form of liquidity risk is when you try to sell your assets and liquidate them and you can't do it. So we have to figure out a way to deal with this in our bank. What can we do? How can we change our balance sheet to try to mitigate this liquidity risk? Well, there's another potential problem that we could run into, actually. So you see this picture here. This is a home. I don't know where it is, but it says, help, foreclosure. This is a homeowner who is now unable to pay their mortgage to the bank. So let's think about it. We have made a billion dollars worth of car loans. It is inevitable that some of those car loans are going to default. And if we don't try to plan for this, we call this credit risk. If we don't try to plan for and mitigate credit risk, this could also put our bank under. Now, why is it that this could put our bank under? It's because we're so highly levered. We have $900 billion that we've or $900 million that we've borrowed, and we have a billion dollars worth of car loans. So think about it. If $100 million worth of those car loans default, so if 10% of our car loans default, now our total assets will only be $900 million, which means we would have no bank capital. What if 15% of our car loans default, now we would only have $850 million worth of assets, but we would have $900 million of borrowings. That, my friends, is an insolvent bank. When your liabilities exceed your assets, you're insolvent. So we call this credit risk, this idea that some people are not going to be able to pay back their loans. Again, we have to plan for it. We have to manage it. There's another risk that banks face, and it's interest rate risk. Now, one form of interest rate risk is simply if interest rates increase. And here's the problem with interest rate risk. You remember the yield curve. Well, if you think about it, almost all of the bank's loans are long-term, right? Five-year car loans, 30-year home mortgages. So banks' assets are long-term. So banks are sort of out here at the end of the yield curve. Now, I don't want to confuse anybody. Banks are not, generally speaking, just investing in U.S. Treasuries. But remember, all interest rates in our economy spin off the yield curve. So the interest rate that banks are charging on mortgages, the interest rate that banks are charging on cars, those all spin off the yield curve. So banks have very long-term assets, and here's the interest rates that they're earning. Their liabilities, however, their deposits, are incredibly short-term. Remember, a depositor can pull his or her money out basically at will. So their liabilities are super short-term. So that's why this works. Right Here's the interest rates they have to pay to depositors down here on the short end of the yield curve. Here's the interest rates they're earning on their loans on the long end of the yield curve. But the real key to understanding bank risk is they have long-term assets and short-term liabilities. Long-term assets, loans, short-term liabilities, deposits. If interest rates start to tick up, you can have a little bit of a problem. Here's the problem. Since your liabilities are so short-term, when the interest rates tick up, your 
deposit rates have to react immediately, otherwise people will pull their money out of your bank. So as interest rates tick up, your deposit rates have to increase. So the interest rates you're paying on your liabilities goes up. Now the interest rates you can charge on your loans will also go up, but it will go up more slowly. Right? In other words, the composition of your loan portfolio is going to change more slowly. Sure, the new loans that you issue will be at a higher rate, but you're still going to have all those existing loans in your portfolio that were locked in at the rates before rates climbed up. So rising interest rates can create problems for banks because, because their liabilities, their deposit rates have to go up immediately, but the interest rates in their asset portfolio go up more slowly as the composition changes. So that's one form of interest rate risk, but the more damaging, more destructive, more disconcerting form of interest rate risk is when the yield curve inverts. So we know that this only happens rarely, but if a yield curve inverts, think about how destructive this would be to a bank because they have short-term liabilities, long-term assets. So the rates that they would have to pay on their deposits might be up here, but the rates that they would be able to charge on their loans would be down here at the long end of the yield curve. That is a recipe for insolvency. When you're making this much and you're having to pay that much, right? Again, that's a recipe for insolvency. So this is the most destructive and damaging form of interest rate risk is when the yield curve inverts. So there are three main types of risk that my bank is going to face. Liquidity risk, and whether that's people demanding their money or that's the risk that I simply can't liquidate my assets, it's a huge risk for my bank. Credit risk, the risk that my borrowers are not going to be able to pay back their loans. And if that happens with too much frequency, I can quickly become insolvent. The third risk that banks face is interest rate risk, whether it's volatility in interest rates or a yield curve inversion any of those things could prove disastrous for a bank. So our task tomorrow in class is to try to figure out exactly what banks do to manage and mitigate these risks so that they don't become insolvent. I will see you then.